determinism, just really how it applies to fuel and what are the, what are the implications? Um, so, is this, so, I mean, there might be different implications for what would happen if we found out that we do have it or don't have it. Um, if we, I, I actually think that in both cases, probably not much. Um, if we discovered that we do have it, I think it wouldn't really have any societal implication because I think like the sort of naive assumption that people just don't want to give up is that we do and until there's like knockdown evidence, that's what they think. So if we confirmed that scientifically, I don't think it would change anything. If we found out that we don't for sure and certain, it would probably be initially depressing for a while and then, you know, the public has a five minute memory. So you go, yeah, whatever, let's go to the movies. That's what, that's what I think would happen. Right. Right. Well, I was just thinking because, I mean, you're thinking of granting and funding for, you know, if we specifically want to tackle that question, you've got to give them, you know, well, what would be the implications? Of, How it would know? have implications yeah. for funding, like, research and stuff like that? Well, for getting funding and having a justification for the impacts. Oh, you mean for getting getting the funding for the research to, to discover the answer? Yes. <laughs> uh, but, uh, because right. they're worried about what, the, what that will tell us? Well, I mean, I... Why is it a useful like why is it a useful question in terms of how it'll actually change anything? That's you uh, kind of answered it. I, so, I mean, my view. I mean, some people might disagree, but my view is that it's probably not that useful. It's just a really interesting question about the nature of being human, and I doubt that it. You know, I hope I have libertarian freedom, but if I don't, oh well. Like, yeah, thank you. Hey, okay. Anna from University of British Columbia. My question goes to Andrew and Ward, the last speaker. Okay. So, um, as imagine that your participants in the last study that you presented us, your participants were mind wandering instead of mind blanking. How different would you expect your data to be? Or in other words, is there a confound? Right, so they could just be thinking about something else entirely, right? And yes. that would explain why yes. they weren't paying attention to those words. Yeah. Uh, so I think within that study that uh, I don't necessarily have um, like a knockdown argument that, that wouldn't be what was happening, right? You can talk about, well, here's what we asked them to do. Um, and it just turned out that every single participant did something else like reliably, um, which would be unfortunate that they all chose to all do the same wrong thing. Um, uh, but yeah, within that study, I don't think that there's necessarily something built into it that, that solves that combined with the, the other studies, I think um, it might. So we find these same kind of patterns um, across studies. And then also there's another body of research that I didn't have time to present that yeah. does differentiate mind blinking from mind wandering in other senses. And so um, if they are mind wandering there, right, um, and that's why they're not paying attention to these words, that could possibly create the same pattern of results. And we haven't tested that. Um, and so that could be an argument against that study, although I don't think it suggests that mind blinking and mind wandering are the same thing. Um, but yes, within that study, I, th I think that's a, a valid, a very valid criticism. Um, uh, other studies we have, again, show that mind blinking and mind wandering um, follow completely different time trajectories, aren't related to each other. People report both when they're asked to monitor for both. C can you, can, you, things, can you specify on an experimental design that allows you to distinguish between mind wandering and mind blanking without relying on the subjective report? How do you do this? Um, so without re relying on subject subjective report, that's tough because the vast majority of mind wandering stuff re relies on subjective report. I mean, even the ones that don't, our subjective report paired with other things such as neural evidence or looking at eye tracking, uh, whatever it, it happens to be. Um, so, so a lot of what we do actually is based on subjective report. You can do a probe, which reduces demands on people doing things post hoc, right? So you can interrupt people in the moment like, and just ask, you know, right now, were you thinking of this task? And if not, were you wandering, were you blank, whatever. Um, and people report both, so individuals report doing both, which suggests that they have at least different conceptualizations of each. Um, so at least from the perspective of that individual, these are distinct mental states. Um, and they're not correlated which, within the individual, which means that it's not like, uh, if they're anti-correlated, that means that people either categorize the same mental state as being either wandering or blanking, but it's actually, it could be the same mental state, right? Um, or if they're positively correlated, 
Um, it could just mean that they kind of don't really have a clue. They just know they're never thinking about what they're supposed to be thinking of and sort of picking uh, both one, both equally. So a lot of it, uh, one of the best ways is just self-report but probe because that reduces demands on going back in time or like accepting that people are going to snap out of it and report that it's happening. Um, but one of the best ways to differentiate the two, between the two is just to ask about both in the same experiment and see kind of the pattern and results in reporting both mental states. So, Thank you. Thanks. Hi, uh, my question is for uh, Dr. Rosenthal, Maxwell Ramstead from the uh, University of Montreal. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate as to why uh, your current views don't, um, don't imply epiphenomenalism. I'm sorry, don't just what? Uh, don't imply epiphenomenalism. Uh, well, there's, I mentioned a kind of equivocation in the term of epiphenomenalism. Uh, are you asking about the philosophy version where mental states wouldn't have any causal efficacy at all? Well, uh, that's probably not what you're defending because of uh, your, your higher order theory. What, what I, I'm, I'm particularly talking about like conscious mental states and so conscious mental states uh, are states that we're aware of in some suitable way. Uh, I'm not getting what you mean, though, by epiphenomenalism. It seems, I mean, I, I guess to some extent I may be taking this as an article of faith that everything that occurs has causal impact on the rest of reality, at least locally. Uh, and but very often things that occur, like I drop a water bottle, has no particular function. Well, this one did in order to illustrate a point, but you get, <laughs> you see what I mean. Uh, so having utility and having causal efficacy are two very different things. I'm saying no causal, plenty of causal efficacy, or at least a reasonable amount of causal efficacy but no particular utility or very, very little. Does that? Yeah, it does. Thank you. I do. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> Hello? OK. Uh, so I have a question about, so the talk was focused in, in large part on studies that explicitly put animals in very harmful situations on purpose, such as social isolation, right? Um, and my question is, is more what your thoughts are, um, and I guess maybe you have an inkling of them because you uh, talked about veganism, uh, but in terms of studies that don't explicitly try to make monkeys depressed, for example, um, but use monkeys in experimental settings um, just in general. So, for example, stuff with uh, Felix Fornican doing things about uh, altruism. Um, you know, they treat the monkeys well, but they're out of their natural environment. I've done some work with uh, Lori Santos, so I'm sorry, um, where <laughs> we're looking at kind of moral decision making in primates and comparing that to children and adult humans. Um, in both of these cases, the, the monkeys are treated well, but they are taken out, taken out of their kind of natural setting, which I could see as being a, a form of abuse, even though it isn't uh, kind of explicitly intended to be. So what are your thoughts on studies like that? And also, is it worth doing studies of those natures, in, of that nature, like in order to understand things? Um, and like, because the cost of the monkey ostensibly is less, um, but not zero and not negligible. Um, does that adjust sort of your computation of the cost-benefit analysis, or are all animal studies in general um, just kind of, should those be off the board? Yeah, uh, good question. I'll try to answer it briefly. I, I'm inclined to take cases on a case-by-case -case basis. So um, <clears throat> in general, I think the more we can leave each other to pursue those things that make us happy, the better off we are. But leaving animals in wild conditions isn't always the best thing for them. Sometimes they're better off in the lab. So I'm happy to look at each case uh, in particular. Uh, that said, I do think we're ten, we, we, we're ten to uh, 
bias and self-interest and what we think is uh, a happy state for an animal may simply be a happy state for that animal within the parameters we've given it and we easily could enlarge the parameters to a state where it was uh, happier in terms of its, its uh, evolved desires. I'm an animal welfare scientist, so I just want to also uh, answer that question. Um, for the last 40 years, been, we're looking at mainly farm animals, but also lab animals and all sorts of other animals in all sorts of conditions on how to measure distress. And we now do have some fairly straightforward guidelines on how to measure distress. The other second part of it is, well, what about a quality of life, which is, I think, the second part of your question, should they be left out in the wild? But as you mentioned, the wild isn't always the best possible place. So how do you measure that in terms of whether it's acceptable or not for the animal? And I think you can do that by, by basically measuring behavioral restraints, whether or not they're able to perform all the behavior in their repertoire, which does not cause suffering to others, because the others also have a, a, a need, a desire to not suffer. So there are ways, I think, which you can monitor individual experiments. The third part of it is, what use is it going to be? Is the use really trivial or not to allow if you're going to cause these animals to suffer? And I must say, I think there's been a lot of trivial animal suffering over the last week, at least not, <laughs> not in the animals now, but the animals that have been used for these experiments, which certainly would not probably be permitted in Europe, where we do have some serious ethical uh, concerns which are put into practice in law now. And the same with pigs, your pig example. Sorry. Well, yes, Gary never really got a chance to answer my question, and I wonder if he could make a stab at it now, Jennifer Mather. Um, do you think that we should only be concerned with animals that have a theory of mind, that we can download the research, so to speak, onto animals that we don't think there should be ethical considerations for? And for that matter, how do you figure out which animals we should have ethical considerations for? Yeah, another great question. And again, my answer is, uh, my inclination is to take it on a case by case basis. So no, I don't think our ethical consideration should only include animals with theory of mind. That's actually why I chose monkeys, because I don't think they do have those capacities, and yet I'm quite convinced that they're depressed <laughs> and feeling pretty awful, and I think we should care about that and weigh that heavily. Uh, how heavily? That depends on the purposes of the study. If uh, we could identify the neural correlates in the monkey brain, which showed that they actually do have theory of mind and we were just missing it from their behaviors, that would be pretty important evidence and might justify depressing 78 monkeys because monkeys to come, we would understand better and treat them better. So again, uh, I think we want to know as much as we can behaviorally and anatomically and physiologically and neurologically about the individuals we're dealing with, but we also have to put that in the context of limited resources and the fact that uh, we ought to care about humans uh, and uh, try to respect and make our policies and institutions uh, happy for them, probably first, uh, and then take account of these other things. Again, case by case basis, but in general, be wary about your bias and be sensitive, be hum humble about what we actually don't know about the species that we are exploiting. Hi, Pierre Boucher from Waterloo. Uh, my question's for Adrian Ward. Uh, I was just wondering what you, uh, you call the ironic processes of mental control. Why do you think that happens? Uh, the ironic processes just in general, why? why? Yeah. Uh, so, I can tell you the theory, um, and then when you get a little bit too deep into it, it starts getting nasty. Um, the idea behind it, 
um, is that basically whenever we're trying to attain a given mental state, there are two processes at work. Um, there's something we call the, the conscious operating process, and so that's what's trying to, or trying to avoid a, a mental state, I'm sorry. Uh, so that's what's searching for things other than that mental state, right? Trying to occupy your mind with anything other than what you're trying to avoid. At the same time, we have a non-conscious monitoring process, and so there are these two processes, which is why it's the processes theory. Um, and what that's doing is basically searching for errors. And so it's searching for anything, that very thing that you're trying to avoid. So if you're trying not to think of a white bear, your conscious operating process is looking for uh, chairs and you know, whatever else. Um, the whole time you have this non-conscious process saying, okay, well don't think of white bears, and it's looking out for white bears or wherever they might appear. Um, the problem happens with the fact that the conscious process is something that is easily interrupted. Um, and the non-conscious isn't. And so that's why we usually see the ironic effects only when you're on a mental load, because that's occupying that conscious operating process, um, and, or when it, as a rebound. So that's when you're like intentionally letting go of controlling your thoughts. But the non-conscious process keeps going. And so when the conscious operating process is interrupted, what you find is basically the very thoughts you're trying to avoid, or mental states you're trying to avoid, bubbling to the surface, right? Um, and, and creating those mental states. And that's, that's the basic rundown of it, is that um, whenever the conscious process is interrupted, the non-conscious process produces what you were trying to avoid. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Juliette, University of Montreal. My question is for Dr. Balaguer. Um, this is just a little bit... Um, some thoughts that I have about free will in general. Um, irrespective of whether free will actually uh, exists or not, whether um, we can have a will completely independent of uh, external or internal events which we don't control, um, it seems to me that an important uh, point is the fact that we do feel this free will. And so I'm wondering uh, why is that? And um, is there any, any significance for this feeling of free will? And uh, I was wondering then, does this feeling of free will come from the fact that the will is actually free, or for the mere, from the mere fact that um, we have um, independent choices, or we have choices that are presented to us, and that we have the ability to ponder about what we want to do about these choices. And so if you think of a situation, for example, um, a spouse wondering whether um, in a situation where you have the, the, um, the, the possibility of uh, cheating upon your spouse, if you don't believe in free will, you're going to say, oh, I have this desire to cheat, and so uh, I'm just going to do it. But if you have the feeling that you have a free will that can ponder about the situation, then uh, you're going to delay your action, and then other events can come up that will um, expand in basically the possibility space of your decision. Um, and then um, I think it makes your um, possible actions more um, perhaps richer in a sense, and that, 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 had an, that would be an advantage. And so then it could be, yeah. Okay, so it seems like there was two different things going on. One was you were at the beginning asking about where the feeling comes from. Um, I think it's, it's definitely possible that the feeling, the feeling is compatible with everything being full-blown determined and not really having free will. Um, so it could be an illusion. The question where it comes from, that's another empirical question, I, and I don't know the answer to it. Uh, and it's an interesting question. But the, the second thing you were saying about um, if you don't believe that you have free will, then you'll just, you know, you'll just, you know, cheat on your husband or wife and, or whatever the, the thing is. I, I frankly doubt it. I think that it might seem like you would do that, but I, I think it would be really hard for us to even if we came up with evidence that we thought was compelling for thinking we don't have this kind of free will, it would be hard to live that. I think we would just forget it and go on and reason as we did before. And if you, some people might go, well, there's no free will, so I'm just going to rob this bank if I can get away with it. But I actually think 
not that many people would do that. They would just go on deciding as they had before. That's an empirical question what people would do. I don't know, but I suspect, I think I would just go on as before if I was convinced I didn't have free will. Thank you. <clears throat> so Mark, you must know about this uh, research that uh, puts people in uh, classrooms and then has, has them read something that's proving that they don't have free will and then put, gives them the opportunity to cheat and then the control reads the opposite, that we have free will and so on. And there is a yeah. difference. People cheat if they think they don't have free will. Yeah, so, so maybe I'm wrong in what I said a minute ago, but I meant that to be um, coming on the idea that, yeah, it'll affect you for a little bit and then you'll just sort of forget and go back. So. Uh, I wonder what the results would be if you did that and then three weeks later tested them or a year later tested them. Maybe it would be the same and then I would just take back what I said, but uh, I wonder. Yeah. Can I also comment? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so there's actually a, a paper about this that talks about uh, free will being the mind's best trick and that even if you were convinced that you didn't have free will at a cognitive level, every single thing we do makes us feel like we have free will. And so I, th I think I agree with you that you know, it might have this short-term effect, but in the long term, when you go throughout your life, you continue to have this feeling that you're causing your actions. And that's going to outweigh reading something in class that says that you don't. Um, so eventually, it, it just keeps coming out. And I think that speaks to what you were saying as well, in that you know, we I could actually have these unconscious causes um, of our actions that are causing both the sort of feeling of intention and then the action itself. Um, but it doesn't feel that way, right? So uh, for purposes of how we live our lives, it, it matters what we, we feel like. Yeah. I think I agree with all of that. Uh, but I would reiterate the thing that I said to Al Mealy's question before. Um, what's very clear is that we're not in conscious awareness. We're not aware of the causal antecedents of our conscious decisions, of the decisions that come to be conscious. And that seems by itself to be enough to keep us sort of acting, as we would put it, as though we had free will. But I don't know whether that by itself is really acting in a serious way as though we had free will. It's just acting as though, well, a lot of this thinking and deciding and volitions and all of that stuff comes from, well, I'm not quite sure where. It comes from somewhere, and I'm going to go on. And that's, that's a kind of simulation of something like free will. Laurence Dumont from University of Montréal. My question is for Adrian Ward. I'd like to know, um, in the self-reports you have of uh, mind blanking, do you think um, it really is an increase of mind blanking or an increase of attention towards mind blanking, that you would just notice them more often, so it would not really be an increase? Right. So in all of the situations, like we tell everybody the same thing about mind blanking to find it. So everybody is kind of attuned to this idea of mind blanking, um, I think you're right that uh, when we tell them not to do it, they might be more aware of when they are doing it. Uh, one study I think that uh, provides some evidence against that uh, interpretation would be the alcohol study. Um, and that uh, you get this interaction right across the effects even though we have three separate conditions in which we're ostensibly uh, increasing their attention towards it. Mm -hmm. right? Um, and when we people, tell people not to go blank and they're not under load, uh, they report going blank less. So are they being more accurate about how much they're going blank? Um, which seems like the opposite of I th what I thought your question was asking. So if we tell them to not go blank, they are more attentive towards it and so they notice it every time it happens. Mm -hmm. Or are they actually being more accurate? Uh, in any event, uh, we see this interaction where it changes depending on the load conditions. So uh, you could ask the question, is this just changing the effects of the attention we pay to mind blanking and then how we report about it? Um, I don't think that's the most parsimonious one. Uh, I think you could in interpret it that way, though. So yeah, great question. Thank you. Right, my question is for Dr. Rosenthal. Rosenthal um, at the beginning of your talk, you made 
a distinction between um, the, the, individu the individual being conscious, being conscious of something, and uh, having conscious mental states. Yes. Um, however, you say mental states emerge. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry again. You, uh, from what I understood, uh, vol in, in your model, volition brings a behavior and consciousness. So, I mean, we'd have to have a volition to be conscious. I, I mean, could you clarify that? Because I mean, uh, let's say I'm sleeping. I am well from a popular, uh, using a popular word, I am unconscious when I'm sleeping, or if I'm, a com if I'm in a coma, I'm unconscious from a popular way of seeing it, but, um, okay. yeah. Well, I can comment on what you've said so far, I think. Uh, I think the term conscious as it's used in contrast with being asleep or in a coma or uh, anesthetized and so forth. That's a perfectly good notion of conscious, but I think it doesn't coincide with the notion of mental states being conscious because when we are awake, uh, I'm assuming that there are a lot of mental states that we're in that aren't conscious states. And I think it's an open question. I, I don't think we know how to decide it yet whether when we're asleep there are some states that are conscious states, like dreams. Uh, some people say they are, but they're just going, I assume, on what happens when they wake up. Um, but I took your worry to be something about being conscious of something even though the state isn't a conscious state. Well, actually, if there's a volition, if there's no volition supporting it, that I'm not understanding. So I'm assuming that what defines a volition is some intentional content plus a tendency to cause behavior. And I'm assuming that can occur without being conscious. And so... Well, that's actually, that's actually my point. I don't see how we can have... A, let's say I'm sleeping and I'm being poked. And well, I'll, forget about sleeping. When you're awake, uh -huh. you could have a desire to do something that isn't a conscious desire. Uh, I mean, you know, you're in the middle of doing one thing and another and you find yourself all of a sudden also doing that. So I might be consciously engaged in talking with you and then pick up my coffee cup and have a little bit of coffee and I'm assuming that there is a volition that results in my doing that with the coffee but it might very well not be a conscious volition. Makes sense. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, this is for Adrian Ward, and I, I want to try and get a little bit more focus on what you mean by blanks. Uh, with a, part of the interest for me was, as you were speaking, I remembered that about 30 years ago I was an external examiner on a master's thesis with the title blanks. And unfortunately, I'm completely blank on what it was about. <laughs> uh, now, now, what I'm pointing to with that is that if I were to go totally blank right now, I'd probably fall over. You know, it just be, wouldn't, there wouldn't be anything. Uh, so when you say blank, it seems blank with respect to something and with respect to what I'm currently thinking about. Uh, so if I think of, instead of a stream of consciousness, a train of consciousness, a train of thought, then it suggests to me that something comes in and interrupts at the coupling, that there's some kind of masking that goes on. So I'd like to try and get a little bit more uh, clarity on that. Right. That's a, that's a great question. I'm, I'm glad you asked it, um, partially because I'm still figuring out what I think the answer is. Um, I've been wrestling with it for five years now. Um, so I'll be surprised if I come up with the right answer right now. Um, certainly a, a conscious thought, but I mean, obviously that's not the only kind of level of awareness that we have. And I agree that like if we completely lost consciousness, we would fall over and that's one of the interesting things is like at what level do we define consciousness? Like how much do we have to have to keep going? I mean, even when people are, are blank, 
they're still existing in a certain sense, right? Well, or, um, or they're still aware of everything except that one thing, you know, like I... Right. They may be aware cases. of something. They're just not aware of anything they can report being aware of. So it's almost a question of what are the things that we have the capacity to report awareness of, um, or at what level do we have to be aware of those things? Um, so it could be that maybe people can only report being aware um, post hoc, uh, at least, on things that they consciously thought about. Um, whereas in the moment, you might, like with descriptive experience sampling stuff, people report just being aware of like the redness of something, but not actually thinking about the word red. And so you're, you sort of have this whole experience, none of it actually having to do with verbal contents. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure how far it goes. I know that I believe at least you know, uh, verbal conscious thought um, is gone. Uh, what else is gone? I think that's still open to exploration. Yeah, I'll do this very quick. This is for um, Adrian Ward. Um, there's a study where subjects do a repetitive task and they do it right for a while and then they make an error and then right and then an error. And when you record the EEG, you can see sort of a trace 20 or 30 seconds before they make that error and it's highly predictive of them making that error. And I was wondering if you know of any studies for uh, combining EEG and mind blinking. Um, or if you'd be interested in doing EEG with that to see if you can see like a build up to where they're going to have a mind blink. Right, so uh, these studies are the first on mind blinking per se, so it hasn't been done. Uh, I am interested in it. Um, it's just a question of where it goes. So I think uh, a lot of the, the questions about mind blinking are, are super valid um, and they're here in part because this is very early, and so we're still trying to outline the parameters of it, and and doing things like the EEG research, uh, maybe even the fMRI research, can help with that. Um, so that's the short answer. Is that short? Is that good? Okay, Great. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Hi, uh, my uh, hello. My name is Lynn Mayer from UCAM. My question is to Professor Rosenthal. I understood about the utility of consciousness. The I'm sorry. Um, can you speak? Closer. Okay. okay. So about the utility of consciousness, I got that you pointed out the reportability of mental states. Is that correct? I didn't understand. I'm sorry. I'm talking about the utility of mental states being conscious as opposed to their occurring without being conscious. Right. And one aspect of the mental state being conscious is that it can be reported on the mental state. You, you That's a mark of it, yes. It's, I, don't, I would, wouldn't go so... I mean, there could be any number of things that would interfere with reportability, but it's a good indicator. Okay, so as an indicator, that, that would confirm that consciousness has occurred. And that indicator, would it be rated according to how you semantically, complexly explain that mental state? Like let's say someone asks, how are you? Oh, I'm great. Was that a report on my mental state or does it have to be more contextually? Well, I think that there's an important difference between expressing a mental state and reporting a mental state. Uh, so if I say it's raining, I'm expressing my thought that it's raining. In order to report my thought that it's raining, I have to say I think it's raining or I have the thought that it's raining or something of that sort. So I think it needs to be reasonably explicit. Uh, the two kinds of speech performance, it's raining, I think it's raining, they go so automatically together with us that it's easy to see them as equivalent. But I think that they're not literally equivalent. Tony Marcel did a wonderful experiment in the late 90s where he asked subjects both in masking cases and blindside cases to uh, indicate whether they were aware of a stimulus or guess about a stimulus in three different ways, verbally, uh, eye blinking, and button pressing. Button pressing was the most accurate, verbal indication was the least accurate. Uh, so I think that there are a lot of fine points here that need to be explored. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Roberto Gulli from McGill, and my question for Dr. Rosenthal starts along similar lines. You, you mentioned, and I agree, that, uh, that consciousness is not necessary to report on something that's present in your environment or present in your, your experience. I would like to know whether you agree or disagree that consciousness uh, could be, or one utility of consciousness could be the ability to report on something that's not a part of or induced by your current environment. Uh, could you give me an example so I know what you have in mind? Uh, so, so you don't need consciousness to say that's a snake on the ground. Right. But could one utility of consciousness uh, be saying, you know, when I went into that cave three months prior, there was a snake there. So being able to report on something that's not induced by your current situation. You're not seeing the snake currently, but you have the, uh, you're able to, to recall that experience of the snake or predict the experience of that snake in the future. I think in humans, usually when we uh, make remarks like that about things that are not present in our perceptual environment, uh, the remarks reflect conscious thinking, uh, but I don't see that the consciousness of the thinking uh, has anything to do with our ability to have those thoughts. So no, I wouldn't be persuaded of that. I think it's it's very tempting to think in our own case that fancy thinking that we do or fancy mentation of any sort that we do um, is aided by consciousness because it often occurs consciously. But it could be simply that the fanciness results in greater neural signal strength. The greater neural signal strength results in consciousness and those two things the fanciness and the consciousness are just independent. So I would, I, I would want some reason beyond the fact that it happens often with people to think that. I, I wouldn't accept that. Okay. Fair enough, thank you. Um, Xavier Derry, UDM. I'm so scared right now. Um, I'd like to hear uh, Professor Gams talk a little bit on, on the following. Uh, We've been exposed to a lot of, uh, a, a, a huge family of arguments that try to defend very weakly, in my opinion, uh, the exploitation of animals for food. Uh, and it's kind of the, um, I guess I would call it the cultural inertia or human nature fatalism, as in we've always done this and, and so it just goes on. And do, do I need to explain more or do you have a, an idea of these arguments? Yeah, yeah, but I'm not sure what your question is. Well, um, your answer would be uh, everyone should turn vegan, and it would just nullify the question of whether or not it's okay to exploit animals because of uh, cultural inertia, tradition, or because human, humans have always done that, or something like that. But I wonder if there's kind of an in-between ground, uh, as in modifying the treatment or the approach we have at farming animals instead of just stopping to eat them, to be sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's better to kill a cow uh, painlessly than to torture it and stick swords in it. Uh, so I think there are more humane farming methods, but uh, so long as, so it's better to have those methods than the ones we currently have, especially in our country. But um, is it good but, enough? Would it be good enough? Is it good enough? If these methods were implemented, forced upon the whole industry, and it would become the more human we can make it, given what we know, would it be good enough, in your opinion? No. I've, I've been asked to keep answers short, but uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. And I think that it, the reason is because I think the world is best when it's full of satisfied desires. And I think mammals, even though they lack theory of mind and lack categorical interests, have desires, and it's better for them to satisfy them than to have them cut short by death. Fantastic, thank you. Can I, um, um, I'll just uh, intersperse here as well. Um, there is quite a lot of research on all this now. It's not just uh, things out of the mind, as it were. Um, I've actually just written a book on welfare and how you make decisions about welfare, whether it's wild animals or domestic or lab animals or pets or whatever which is trying to summarize rather, rather quickly the um, things. And I will leave, you can have details of that if you want. 
but I think it's a case by case case and no I, I think there's lots of arguments against veganism but that's another whole story um, next one who's next you are uh, Norbert Fürst, in our German Aerospace Center. My question is for Mark Balaguer. Um, yeah, it concerns the question if, in how far uh, formal mathematical models on decision making and, and perception could possibly help uh, resolve or, or help approaching the determinism, de non-determinism problem. I'm specifically thinking on these uh, two alternative decision making. Uh, for example, the, the ambiguous perception uh, things, uh, that there are dynamical systems models available and, and investigated for describing experimental results, which, which work out quite nicely. For example, a, a Netherlands group, Van E and others, where uh, deterministic equations, nonlinear dynamics equations, are combined with uh, stochastic elements. And uh, they have all these kinds of bifurcation and chaotic behavior and, and statistical or stochastic elements. Do you think that this could help? Uh, because they have these uh, deterministic and indeterministic elements in it. This, this could help uh, approaching this problem which you um, So I'd want to look at that, and it sounds interesting, but my gut is telling me that it couldn't help because um, you could construct a model, a mathematical model of a deterministic creature that shows like us, and you could construct a math that, that matched the phenomenology, and you could construct a mathematical model of an indeterministic creature, and without empirical data to figure out which one we are, it's hard to see how the, the mathematics by itself could settle the question. Um, and it, I would say the same thing about quantum mechanics. How could you use mathematics to figure out whether the quantum event is determined or not? Yeah, the question is in how far these uh, models, in fact, describe experimental results. And they do. Uh, one, one can uh, look at the literature. They, for example, this, this Van A group has a kind of neural level model with this kind of dynamics. And, and they do, in fact, uh, uh, describe experimental results. So that there are states, perception states, which are described in these uh, formal approaches uh, based on, on this kind of dynamics. And so I would say one, one should consider this. Uh, I, I would definitely want to look at it, yeah. I mean, it, I, it should definitely be looked at. I'm just, I was just saying that it's hard for me to see how the pure mathematics could settle it when it ultimately it's a contingent matter of fact that you're trying to, to answer. All right, uh, it's Jens Vignel, University of Montreal. Uh, let, look, the question is for Professor Rosenthal. Uh, let me quote very br briefly uh, Bjorn Brands from uh, yesterday's talk. He said that the processes, uh, the processes by which brains generate variable and sometimes genuinely new behaviors are crucial for brains to generate adaptive behavioral choice and make brains principally unpredictable. And then he went on saying, we know next to nothing about how the behavioral variability is generated that provides a substrate for these selection processes to act upon. Now in your talk, uh, you made a good point of showing that uh, Conscious, the mental states being conscious adds nothing to the rational processes, rational thinking, right? Or at uh, least very little. Oh, very little. Um, at least very little. At least very little. Okay. Uh, now, it may be far-fetched, but uh, you, you said very briefly that it could impede rational thinking in I'm some... I'm sorry. I, I you, said... You, you said, you briefly stated that it could impede... Uh, that oh, yes, process. right. So uh, this impediment, could, it, could, it be a, could this source of kind of noise could bring about, could be a candidate for this variability and thus uh, permit uh, a, selection of, a selection process, permits this noise predicts, uh, could predict um, va added variability within the well so that could bring about new behavior. I don't know if oh, you're quite clear. Uh, well, I hadn't really actually thought of that one. Uh, maybe. So you're, you're saying uh, take an animal that's just like us, except all of our thinking fails to be conscious, then add consciousness. The consciousness adds noise. Exactly. The noise adds variability. Um, it, you, you I mean, I, I, I don't have anything offhand to say against that, except my guess is that there's already a lot of variability right. and it doesn't offhand seem, I mean, I, I think what consciousness adds when it impedes 
rationality is inefficiency rather than variability, and those two are a little bit different. Right. Whether it also adds variability, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I think there's already a lot of variability. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you.